the other side of this wall are children who are having a good time. And they may make noise, and we're grown-ups. And we're not going to tell them to be quiet so that we can focus. Amen? We want them to enjoy church. Uh, also, there are children of God laid out up here right now, getting rocked by the presence of God. And uh, don't be distracted by them either. Amen? Just like I wish I could be childlike back there, I wish I could be on the ground and experience God right now as well. How about you? Amen? Hallelujah. <clears throat> well, I have, a, I have a neat announcement to make. That uh, Jackson and Miriam made it back from Mexico without being abducted. Stand up. They got married. Stand if you would. They got married last, uh, last week. Amen. Good job, guys. Not getting abducted in Mexico. Good job. It happens. It's not. It happens. Shaba. Starting our new message series today, Spiritual Revival. Someone, someone had the right spirit. We're starting our new message series, Spiritual Revival. Who do you who? Hey, I'm going to ask Corey to come up and give a, a testimony real quick. Is that all right? Shaba. Just walking through the maze here. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good to see you. So this morning, um, I was... Uh, Got, got ready a little early. I left my house a little early coming on my way to church, and I, I thought to myself, I got some time. I got, let me go get some gas in my truck. So I pull up to the gas station, and as I'm putting the, uh, the pump in the, in the car, um, someone comes up to me and says, hey, would you mind giving my, my car a jump? And um, immediately I think, oh, no, I have somewhere to be. But then I remember I got plenty of time. I left early. So I'm like, yeah, no problem. I got time. I can help you. So I, I pull up in front of his car, and we set up the jumper cables, and I tell him, you know, I was like, I'm on my way to church. But I left early this morning, so God loves you, man. I, I, have, I have plenty of time to jump your car. He's like, oh, he's like, what, what's the name of your church? I said, it's called Revival Life Church. And he said, so it's, a, it's a Pentecostal charismatic church. He's like, I grew up going to a Pentecostal church. I said, that's awesome, man. And I went on to tell him a little bit about my testimony. I told him when I was 19 years old, I was uh, living wicked. I came here, and God changed my life. And he's like, wow, that's incredible. And then he said, uh, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I, I own a, a fishing tackle company. And uh, we make saltwater fishing tackle. He says, no way. I love fishing. I was just at the Deerfield Pier um, yesterday. Yesterday. And I was like, really? I said, come on back to the back of my truck. I said, I got a ton of stuff in the back. I'd love to, I'd love to give you some stuff. He's like, are you serious? So I open up. I open up my bag. I start to give him some rigs and things like that. He's like, I was just telling my girlfriend yesterday that I, I needed this exact thing. Oh. And I'm like, wow, man, that's awesome, dude. God loves you so much. It's, you know, like, and, and so I just, I continue just to give him what I had in my backpack. Then I opened up my, uh, my tackle box and I started looking through stuff. I said, do you, do you have hooks? Do you need hooks? He's like, well, I don't want to impose or, you know, ask too much of you. I was like, no, take the hooks. And he's like, oh man, thank you so much. I can see he starts getting worked up. And I'm like, you know what, dude, take, take the whole thing. Like just take, take the, take the whole box. And he starts crying. And I'm just like, um, and, and the presence of God just was there. And he starts crying. He says, you don't understand. He's like, I've been living out of my car. I'm homeless right now. Um, and, 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 and I'm been away from God and this is just like, this is crazy. He's like, God is crazy. He's like, I cannot believe, I cannot believe that he would bring you here to do this. It just yesterday I was like, I was telling my girlfriend, I needed this stuff. I was like, let me pray for you, man. So we just start praying. We just start breaking shame off his life, guilt off his life, condemnation off his life. And here he is, you know, living in his car. He's got a cigarette butt in his ear. I'm just like, man, the father loves you. Father loves you, and he had me leave my house 10 minutes early today just so I could be here to tell you that. Just so I could be here and bless you right where you're at. Amen? Amen. So give it up. God is good. God is good. Come on. Amen. God is good. Amen? He's a pretty good God. So here we are in our uh, in, uh, starting a, a, a message series of spiritual revival. And uh, it's really important that when we talk about revival so often... Uh, words mean other words in the church. We say one word, but we mean something else. So often we'll say we want revival, but what we're really saying is we want a, we want a conference church where people keep coming to be part of our church. And, and, uh, and, and that's, that's not what we're talking about. When we talk about spiritual revival, we're talking about the man you see or woman you see in the mirror every day. This person needs spiritual revival. We are believing for spiritual revival in us. Amen? In us and then we want to overflow and we've been talking about this for a couple weeks and here's what we're talking about we want to 
We want to be, we want more of God's presence. We want to be more intentional with God. We want to be more radical for Jesus. How many of you know Corey could have just, you know, oh, I'm busy, I got to go to church. Isn't it funny how many times we skip people who need us to go to church? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this is what we're believing for in this, in this season. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 1. I, um, it's going to be a good day. Amen? It's going to be a good day. At the end of service, I'm going to lay hands on anybody who wants uh, Boomba. A little something, something. And we're going to believe God for it. Amen? A little something, something. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. A very unusual verse if you come to this church. That's a joke. Jesus had said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Can you say amen? Amen and amen. Thank you, Mike. Hey, I don't know about you, but I want to be a Holy Ghost guy. I want to be a Holy Ghost guy. I want to be a, I want to be a person of the Spirit. I want to be a person who's known to be someone who knows who Holy Spirit is. Holy Spirit is the most neglected part of the Trinity in theological study. They call Holy Spirit the Cinderella of the ball. She's, she's named, but she's never really there. People don't talk about her. People don't study her. We know that she's real, but we don't start. I want to be known as a Holy Ghost guy. Amen? I want to be known as someone who's got the Holy Ghost on him, and understands him, understands his ways, and walks in his power. How about you? I want to be a Holy Ghost guy. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, I don't know if you know, I, I was in school this week. I was in Lakeland. And uh, Lakeland, uh, I'm in my, getting my master's, uh, as you know, which is a pretty big deal for me. And um, uh, in, in a master's class, they're smaller than undergrad classes. You know, there's not a lot of people in them. And uh, a good friend of mine uh, was, uh, he couldn't make it to class, so they Skyped him in. Someone had a laptop and uh, had, the, had the Skype open there. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, I didn't know how much of the room he could hear, but, you know, uh, we were having our discussions. And, and I'm sitting there uh, with, with uh, you know, an expert in New Testament theology, Old Testament theology, who's teaching us for four or five days, a great author, his name's A.J. Swoboda, just a really brilliant guy. And uh, he's talking, you know, theology, and, and I'm taking right now practical theology, or excuse me, systematic theology one and two, practical theology, interesting Systematic, not so much. So systematic theology is basically whatever you believe, how do we get there? Let's study every theologian who's ever written on that and see how we got here, any major theologian. So we start around, you know, the, the New Testament writings and we go through all the early church, uh, you know, uh, uh, Alexander of Lyons and, and, and all, the, all the theologians, and we kind of go through how we came up with the doctrine of the Trinity, how we came up with the doctrine of salvation, how we came up with the doctrine of the deity of Jesus Christ. We just kind of go through this, and this can be very, very boring if you're just studying history. But something happens when your professor is baptized in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Then all of a sudden, these facts aren't history lessons. It's actually a journey of the Spirit through time revealing Christ to us. And so me, who likes both Holy Spirit and Jesus, right? Like the one, three, one and three God, right? As he's talking, people are taking notes, and I'm getting rocked by the Holy Ghost. I'm like praying in tongues. I'm like, Shabbat. You know, like he'd say something like, Shabbat. Shabbat. You know, like I'm like, I'm getting rocked. I don't care. I'm like, I'm, I'm the Holy Ghost guy. I don't care. I don't care. I'm getting, I, I am encountering Jesus in these lessons. I'm encountering Jesus. Yeah. It was funny because, it was funny because at one time we were um, going through the doctrine of, of hell and um, which the church doesn't even want to talk about anymore. Like if you don't hate the, if you don't hate the, uh, the doctrine of hell, there's a problem with you, right? If you don't hate the idea of hell, yeah. there's something wrong internally. Right? If you're like, no, no, it's good because God, no, there's a problem. There's a problem. <laughs> right? There's a problem with you. All right? You'll also find that with people who love to study um, end times and revelation. 
They study it enough, you don't see as much fruit of the Spirit on them. Have you, have you noticed that? People who love talking about, the, okay, I don't want to go there. But, um, but it, you know, people who love hell, you just, you don't, you know, whoa, God needs it. Mm. Anyway, so we're studying, um, we're studying the doctrine of hell, and people are kind of debating what it could be and whatnot. And I'm like, yeah, I actually had an encounter where Jesus showed me. And so let me just tell you what Christ showed me about this. And they're like, well, there's something, right? And so they had this, they had this conversation about the tree of life. And, you know, we're talking about, is there time in heaven? Of course there's time in heaven, right? Amen? There's time in heaven, yeah? Right? Because there's tree that brings fruit every month. So they're counting months in heaven, right? So there's time in heaven. And I've talked about, you know, I didn't, you know what I didn't do? I, you know, we had an encounter one time in this church where like 25 people at the same time yeah. got caught up in the third heaven and saw the exact same thing. And they saw fruit of the tree that turned into a bird. And that sounds crazy unless you know that like 15 people saw it at the same time. And so we call them turkey berries. Does that make sense to you? Because it doesn't to me. There better be something about God you don't understand. Anyway, so I'm in, uh, I'm in service and my friend is not there. He's being Skyped in and, uh, you know, I text on your laptop and I get a text message. And uh, I get this, this first text message from my friend Casey and he says, I'm going to make you a t-shirt for graduation. Now, I've not talked to him all week. He didn't even tell me he wasn't going to be there. I was like... And so I text him back, a shirt? Okay, because I'm down for free, right? Like, I'm down for free, right? So I'm like, a shirt? Uh, oh, 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 okay. And he texts me back, this. Now, if you can't see that, let me show you a bigger version of this picture. I don't know where he got the picture from. I don't have any idea where that picture's from. And he took the time during class to make that and send it to me. <laughs> and he thought that would embarrass me somehow. So I replied to him, I'll take it. Because <laughs> I will be the Holy Ghost guy. How, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I will be the Holy Ghost guy. And then he sends, I'm like, I'll take it. You're not going to embarrass me. Then he sends me this. And let me, let me show you a bigger version. Maybe you millennials can explain this to me. I don't know what this means. But then he sends that. I don't know what that means exactly, but I'll take it. I'll take it. Amen? I will take it. It looks like chaos to you, but me, it's relationship with the living God. Amen? Amen. I want to be the Holy Ghost God. I want to be living out of the overflow. I don't want just enough to get by. I want to live out of the overflow. How many of you like coming to the end of the month with extra money? Too many times we run out of money before we run out of month, right? I want overflow. I want overflow. I want overflow in my relationship with God. Amen? Amen. Like, 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 like Corey is like, we didn't even plan this, but Corey had an overflow of time so he could share with someone an overflow of God's love and then an overflow of God's resources for this man who just woke up thinking he was alone. This is where I want to live. Amen? Amen. Are, are you with me? Yeah. I want to live in the overflow. How about you? Yeah. Tell your neighbor, let's live in the overflow. Come on, touch somebody. Tell them, let's live in the overflow. I want to live in the overflow. I want to live in the overflow. But again, we have to understand how, wow, where we're at in God's, wow. Some people, I, 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 I tweeted this the other day, we got to be more than evangelicals with tongues. We got to have better theology than that. Amen? We got to have better theology than dispensationalism with tongues. We, we need something better. Let me help you out. This is where we're at. Again, let me share this. There was the creation, and it was good. He made man, and then he said it was good, good, very good, right? That's in the Hebrew, how you, they didn't have very, you would say a word twice, right, to really emphasize it. Good, good is what it says in the, in the Hebrew, just like when Jesus said verily, verily. He means like, I'm serious about this. Oye, right? Like, this is what he's saying. This is serious. Pay attention, right? It was, it was good. And then we had the fall. The fall, let me help you out. Bad. Leaving Jesus, sin coming into man. Bad, right? Creation was good. Fall, bad, right? And right after the fall, God began a work of redemption, starting with the law. Redemption didn't start with Jesus. It started with the 
law. And so God began sharing his way with people, and he began redeeming her value. The people started redeeming their value. And he, he perfected that redemption on the cross. At the cross of Christ, we were fully redeemed by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. He was born a virgin. He never sinned. Uh, and then he was beaten for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. They nailed him to a cross, though he never sinned. And he died on that cross carrying the penalty of our sin. He didn't stay on that cross. They brought him down. They buried him in a grave. And the grave could not hold him. Amen. He came up out the grave, resurrected into new life where he went up into heaven, where he said, wait, because I'm about to send something really good, right? He said, wait in Jerusalem until I send something amazing. And ever since that redemption, we've been in the process of restoration. Amen? Amen. We are in the season of restoration. We are not in the season of the fall. That is really hard for some people to get. We are in the season of restoration. If you're in the season of the fall, it's time to come through the cross of redemption and get into the season of restoration. Don't drag me into the fall with you. Just because you're having a battle with sin. Don't drag me into the, to make some bad theology because you're battling with sin. Let's, let's, let's believe what God says and we're in a season of restoration. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Jesus said, hey, wait here because I'm going to send something. And they had no grid for what he was sending and he sent the Spirit of Christ on the day of Pentecost. Amen? And uh, and Pentecost came. And here's what I want to say on this Pentecost Sunday is Pentecost brings change. Amen? Amen. Pentecost brings change. It brought change theologically then, but it brings change to our lives when we experience it. Pentecost is not a feeling. It is an experience of the conviction of the living God. Amen? He convicts us into His perfect way. Sometimes that's you need to stop doing what you're doing. Other times that is you need to start doing some other stuff. Amen? That conviction of God that rests upon you and says, you need to go tell that man that I love him. You need to go lay hands on that person and watch them get better. You need to go ahead and commit your finances to Christ. You need to cut this sin out of your life. And sometimes even you got to cut some good things out of your life because that's what the Spirit of Pentecost does. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pentecost brings change. We talk about Pentecost, we know. Uh, it's not actually uh, begun after the resurrection. That's actually the second Pentecost. We're going to talk today at first about the first Pentecost. And if you remember in the book of Exodus, there was this story about God's, wow, God's people in captivity and God's people who were slaves in Egypt. And there's the story of the escape from Egypt. And uh, I need you to see, as I'm telling the story, I need you to see the big picture of what God is doing through his people through this little story. Again, we read the little stories in the Bible to understand the big stories of what God is doing. Amen? Amen. The little story has to fit in the big story. And so I need you to see what God is trying to do in this season. I've already seen the fruit of it. But in, in Exodus, if you remember, uh, Moses went to Pharaoh and said, hey, let the people go. And uh, Pharaoh said, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to do that, right? And so he said, there's going to be a series of woes that come, a series of, a series of bad stuff that's coming. And uh, the tenth woe was uh, the death of the firstborn, if you remember. And he said, of the firstborn of the people and of the cattle and livestock. Hallelujah. 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 I'm getting some stuff here while I'm sitting here. I'm trying to. Have, have you noticed? Did you notice that, 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 that uh, in, the, in the story of creation, um, God made, he made, he made uh, the animals and, the, and, and on all the creeping things, right? And on day, day five, I believe, right? Yes, day five? Man was day six, wasn't he? Man's day six. So on five was the animal. You, what did he make on day five? Anybody? Come on, Mike, you know. What, what did he do? The, on day five. Okay, animals, the creeping things, and the livestock. Livestock. What is livestock? Livestock are, are, are animals that we use for food. That's real food, right? He made fake food earlier. He made real food on day five. 
Listen, livestock is for people. God prepared this place for us when he created us on day six. He created livestock before he created people. So God was always preparing a place for man here on the earth. I think that's a good word. Hallelujah. I was just thinking that while I was just standing here. And so on the, on the, he, he killed the first of the livestock. That's a little free right there. You just take that home. That was free. That has nothing to do with the message. So, um, <clears throat> and so he said to them, listen, kill the lamb and put its blood on your doorpost. And wherever the blood of the lamb is, death will pass you by. Remember this, right? He said, you put the blood on the lamp on the doorpost, and wherever, when the death comes through, it will pass you by. And then he said, the firstborn will die, and then you will go out. That's what God told him. The firstborn will die, and then you will go out. And he says, and I will bring you into a place of redemption. Right? And so fifty. So this happened. Death and destruction came through, and wherever there was not the blood of the lamb... Death came through and it killed the firstborn. And after that, Pharaoh released the Jews. And you know, there was the miraculous journey through the desert and, uh, the, excuse me, the miraculous d- through the water. And uh, then at day 50, uh, they come to this mountain. And at this mountain, God says, uh, no, nobody come up on this mountain. Do not touch this mountain. And and, and Moses leaves Israel, and he alone could go up on the mountain. And the people saw the lightning, and they heard earthquakes, and the, and the earth shook. And, and, and they didn't recognize that everything was changing within eyesight of them. They had no idea that God was birthing something new in their presence that would change everything. They had no idea that while we're back here in the camp, And Moses is away. Moses is literally changing his relationship with man. Literally everything is becoming new. And you remember what they did. They built built an idol in the midst of it. And and, and here's what the Lord spoke to me as I was studying. He said, "When, when we don't recognize our spiritual awakening, we'll fight to stay the same. When we don't recognize our moment of encounter, when we don't recognize the, seer, spirit of, the season of spiritual awakening, we will fight to keep the status quo, to keep things so they don't change because we like normalcy. We like predictability. We like knowing what's going on. But God actually likes to be in control. And while Moses is on that mountain, he's receiving the law. Remember that? He wrote it on two tablets. He, he receives uh, the tablets and he comes down from the mountain and uh, the people were not there readily waiting for Moses to come back. As a matter of fact, they wrote him off. And in the time, they were worshiping a calf made out of gold. Do you remember that? They were worshiping a golden calf. And this is a part of the story people almost never tell when they teach on this. God was then angry, and 3,000 of them were killed in the camp. That's the story. That's the story. 3,000 were killed in the camp. And later on, they asked him, hey, what, what were you doing? Why did you create this engraved image? Why would you dare create this false god? And this is his response in Exodus 32. Let's read it. I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. We threw this gold in the fire and out came this calf as if it magically appeared before them. And that's a lie, of course, right? But it's also a little true because whatever we give our resources to will become a God. Whenever we give all our resources, whenever, whatever, we, whatever, whatever we worship, whatever we give our lives to, we'll worship. They say today, uh, researchers, secular even researchers say, you know, they say that religion is falling in the United States. I don't believe that at all. I believe fake Christians are no longer calling themselves Christians. But <clears throat> they say there's a generation now, they, there's a new term for these parents are called helicopter parents. Have, have you heard of it? And, uh, and um, I remember my wife talking to 
one mom at the high school, and she's like, oh, and they have this science thing due on Tuesday. And my wife's like, how would I know what my kid's homework is? They're in high school. And the lady says, I guess my helicopter flies lower than yours, right? This is what she said to my wife. <laughs> and so they've come, up with this, uh, they've come up with this theory. They've come up with this theory that, uh, that because people aren't worshiping God, they're worshiping their children. People today are worshiping their children, and their entire lives revolve around their children's pleasure. How they interact, how they get together, how they, what their entertainment looks like. Because you will worship something. And what you give your life to, you will worship, unless you have the Spirit of Christ to convict you. Amen? Amen? You know, you can get the people out of Egypt, right? They say, but it's hard to get Egypt out of the people. And so we go back to what we knew. <clears throat> God showed me in this season, he says, uh, he took me through a, pr- a series of prophetic encounters the last couple days, and I knew that God was uh, doing something in the midst of them. But you'll find yourself in one season building something and putting all your energy into it, and you know that's what God has you doing, and the, and the grace is in it, and you're seeing the fruit of it, and you're showing it on Instagram, maybe you're telling people, maybe there's a calling, or maybe you start a little business out of a hobby, or maybe, I don't know, maybe you did something just, just amazing. And in the next season, it's time for you to kill it. The very next season, God says, all right, that it served its purpose, now it's time for us to move on. And you're like, no, 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 but I have this beautiful thing that I built. This vision that I told everybody about, this thing that I put on my reason. This is a, I thought this was the pay, place of preparation that I was going to come into the calling in this thing. And God is like, no, 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 no. That was just a place of preparation. Wow. I've found that the place of preparation is rarely the place of calling. Wow. Come on. Come on. And God just has you labor in a place of preparation and for the next thing that's coming. And he's now looking, when you gave me everything on the altar, is it also the stuff that will come that you'll put on the altar? Now you have this valuable thing that you've been working on. Is that now your God? Right? And I've been there. Have you been there? I've been there. Maybe a calling, maybe a ministry, maybe a gifting. Maybe, maybe you got finances that you got blessed with, and then all of a sudden somebody with a need comes up, and you're like, yo. I know it's coincidental that they're two exact same amounts of money, but, but this is a blessing for me and mine, obviously, God. No, that was a place of preparation for the place of service. And I just feel like in this season, so many of us, it's time to take a turn. And God, in that turn, we're putting some things on the altar that we thought were for the long haul, but we're really, God was just giving something to give as an offering. God will equip you for the offering. If you have any kids who are going to Revival Kids and are giving to, uh, uh, what's his name? Lewis, our compassion child. If you got it, whoa, if your kids have given money to Lewis, you know that it was you equipping your kids to give. And I hope you do. I hope you teach your kids how to give by giving them money to give. Because God gives us money to give. Amen? I mean, you won't give it to somebody. Might as well give it with God. Does this make sense? So he's having us tear down what we built for this new season and this new call. And, and, and we place ourselves in bondage when we don't allow God to deal with the idols that we have built. And we don't allow God to deal with our sin nature that that loves to hold on to stuff for the long haul that's really just temporary. Does that make sense? I'm not getting, I'm not, this isn't like too heavy, right? Like we're good? Like they keep telling me you got to give basic messages on Sunday morning. I'm like, I don't, I don't know basic messages. I just got revelation. Come on. So on that first Pentecost, they celebrate it now. The Jews do the Feast of Weeks. It's the, they celebrate when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And that's what the, that's what the Jews call Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. And, and so we see in the Gospel, if you remember the Gospel, remember you heard the Gospel? About Jesus and His birth of a virgin, His life, His death, His resurrection, and His second coming. That's, that's the Gospel. The gospel is not, God would sure like you to have a jet, right? That is not the gospel. The gospel is not, you know, don't worry, one day you'll get the biggest house in town, uh, though I wish it were true. The gospel is not even if if you give enough money, God will give you even more. I'm sorry. It's impossible to have that theology and recognize our Christian brothers and sisters living in poverty in Africa. Can't have both. They can't be our brothers and sisters and that be an absolute doctrine of the gospel. We have to say, 
God does bless those who give. Maybe money, right? Yeah. Often it is, sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes it's the Holy Ghost hookup, which is my favorite. I love getting things that I have no reason to get. And I just tell you it's the Holy Ghost hookup. I don't know what to tell you. Just blessed. Hashtag blessed, right? <laughs> Got a tattooed right here. Let me show you. No. <laughs> just to prove. I see most people with that tattoo don't look so blessed, but that's neither here nor there. <clears throat> and so Jesus, the main character in our New Testament, we see that he again was, was murdered on that cross. And a lot of exciting things happened immediately after that, including his resurrection. And, uh, uh, and, then, and then he says, hey, wait, wait in Jerusalem because there's more, right? He's like, wait. There's more, right? Like this isn't all there is. There's actually more. And so 50 days later, we find, we find a group of men are in a prayer meeting. Amen? A group of men. And I, you know what? This group of men are an amazing group of men. And I'm, you just have to forgive me for the bunny trails today, okay? I feel like I'm like overflowing right now. And I know if I was more disciplined, I'd keep it together. But I shared this first service. I thought I'd share it second service. I don't want to rob you of the blessing. So Jesus was resurrected, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a yes. Um, there are a lot of doctrines today that are getting up for debate, right? And what Pentecost does, what Pentecost has always done is Pentecost always ushers in social justice. That's a political word to some people, but it's actually a biblical term that's been politicized. All right, if you don't care about the orphan, then you probably haven't encountered Jesus. Right? We're on the same page, right? I'm not talking about anything that, 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 that Fox News or MSNBC has told you that means. I'm talking about what Jesus talked about, right? Yeah. All right? And so any time that there's, a, there's an outpouring, uh, like people have less bondage, right? And so um, in the Azusa Street, that was a great racial reconciliation happened. I mean, it, it means something that the guy who started the Azusa Street revival wasn't even allowed in the meetings in Kansas that he learned about revival because he was black, right? So we got a one-eyed son of a sharecropper who wasn't allowed in the meetings now leading the revival, and it was multiracial. And we saw a real racial reconciliation happening. And uh, when uh, Pentecost gets poured out, there's also the, the equality of the genders, right? But that's not a new doctrine. I've had debates with people recently about whether or not this is some sort of new doctrine, whether that women and men or that God actually created people equal. Like that's, that's, it's really hard. Religion makes it hard to wrap your brain around simple things, right? Ma makes it hard. And so I had this epiphany. You remember when Jesus got resurrected? What, what were the apostles doing? Anybody remember? Praying. They were hiding. They were hiding because they thought the same people who were going to kill, who killed Jesus were going to come kill them. So they were in a prayer meeting behind <laughs> locked doors on a second floor room where they could see anybody coming. This is where their prayer meeting was. Right? And so Jesus was risen from the dead. And he probably could have showed up anywhere, yeah? Who did he show himself to? Right? A woman who wasn't hiding. And what did she do? She ran and told what? What? She told the disciples. Now, there's a doctrine out there that women can't teach men. Is there any deeper first revelation to teach than Jesus has risen from the dead? Is there any, like, is there something deeper than the resurrection that you could teach? And Jesus chose a woman to teach that to the apostles. They say, well, he'll use a woman when he can't. Find a man to use. Like, I thought my Bible said he'll raise up a rock if he needs to. <laughs> Women aren't God's second choice. I mean, this is like. <laughs> so they say, well, I don't want to go down that road. That's not even what I'm talking about. I'm almost running out of time here. Shaba. <laughs> so preach on, preacher women. Amen. So 50 days after this, uh, the Jesus Christ, he told them, wait in Jerusalem. And then they're in this prayer meeting. 
And we read here in Acts chapter 2, it says, they were all together in one place and suddenly, say suddenly. When you read in the Gospels, look for words like suddenly. Anytime you see suddenly, you'll notice there's a trend. I don't want to go through that right now. Uh, And suddenly, there came from heaven a noise. Say a noise. A noise like a violent rushing wind. Wasn't a wind, it was a noise, like a wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, Shabba. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Can you say amen? See, this was the second Pentecost. The first Pentecost was that Feast of Weeks when Jesus, or excuse me, when Moses brought the law down from the mountain, but this is the second Pentecost. On the first Pentecost, it was 50 days after the death of the lamb whose bones you weren't to break. In the second Pentecost, it was 50 days after the lamb of God whose bones were not broken. In the first Pentecost, there was the death of the firstborn, but on the second Pentecost, there was the death of God's firstborn. In the first Pentecost, it happened once and they celebrated it for all times. On the second Pentecost, it continues to happen to this day. The second Pentecost is a complete reversal of the first Pentecost. The first Pentecost was freedom from Egypt in the power of the Pharaoh. The second Pentecost is the freedom from sin and the power of the enemy. The first Pentecost, they started as God's people, but they ended as pagans that day. In the second Pentecost, we start as people far from God and we end as God's people. In the first Pentecost, 3,000 people were murdered. On the second Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved. Can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. On the first Pentecost, the law came down. On the second Pentecost, grace came down. On the first Pentecost, People, on the first Pentecost, people used fire to form an idol. On the second Pentecost, God used fire to form God's people. We are in a second Pentecost. Can you say amen? Can you say amen? Come on. Paul said we no longer live by the law, which came down on the first one, but we live by the spirit that came down on the second one. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. 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 You are not created for rules. You are created for relationship with God. And the Pentecost is the thing that makes that available. Hallelujah. 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 On the first Pentecost, they celebrated it once every year by going to Jerusalem. Now, on the continual Pentecost, it comes to you and then spreads out to the world. Amen? This is the second Pentecost. This is who we are. This is what we're leaning into in this season. We're leaning into this second Pentecost as a way of life. We're leaning into the Spirit of Christ coming down and filling us with power so we can share it with the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. And three real quick things if you're taking notes. We want to experience this second Pentecost. But three things I want you to keep in mind. If you're taking notes, write it down very quickly and I'm almost done. You have to be honest enough to say, I need spiritual revival. You got to be honest enough to say, I need spiritual revival. On that day, on that that second Pentecost, the fire of God fell on those men in the room and they burst out into the streets praying in tongues and shouting and it looked like a commotion and people were mocking them and people were making fun of them. But some people were honest enough to say, I need spiritual revival. Let's take a look in Acts 2, 37. It says, now when they heard this, see, Peter began preaching the truth to them when this Pentecost hit them. And he says, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, What shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the second Pentecost. Come on. 
you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Come on. But you got to be honest enough. This man was honest enough to say, what is it? What is it? What do I need to do? What is it? And, and in this season, you may need to get honest enough to get with some man and say, listen, I see what your family's walking in. What do I need to do to walk in the same blessing? You may need to go to somebody and say, I, I know you got free of this thing. What do I need to do to get free? You may need to go to God and say, what do I need to do? What do I need to give up? What dreams need to go on the altar? What gift needs to go on the altar? What seed do I need to sow in this season that I may reap Pentecost? Amen? Amen. Come on. Amen. You have to be humble enough to say, what must I do? What must I do? <clears throat> God is a, I've encountered God in several <clears throat> spiritual events in my life, prophetic events in my life in the last just couple days. It's really kind of crazy. Just in the last couple of days, a series of prophetic events. And I uh, was working in my yard yesterday. Just track with me for a minute, if you would. It gets good. Working in my yard yesterday, and uh, <clears throat> my, my pool has been a bit of a struggle for me. And uh, <clears throat> my pool is uh, looking nice, which makes me happy. And I got one of these little creepy crawly things. Anybody know what that means? It's like you got a little hose, and it kind of moves around, kind of, so you don't have to brush the, the, the bottom of the pool. It kind of sucks all the dirt off. And, and, in, and, in, and in heaven, my creepy crawly is going to just do this and keep the whole pool clean. In heaven, that's what's going to happen. That is, we're, my pool is still in the fall. I'm believing it for the, rest of, the, the, the restoration of all things, but it hasn't happened yet. And so sometimes if your pool is like mine, the thing gets stuck. It, they're stupid, right? They're, they're like small children, right? They just get stuck. <laughs> and um, let's be honest. Can we just be honest? Beautiful, but stupid. And they'll get stuck, you know, by the stairs or by, you know, what, they get stuck. And so I got mine all set up. I had my son actually help me with it and I threw it in the deep end so, you know, I could have a little bit of time before it got stuck. Went to go do yard work. I turned around and it's stuck in the deep end. I'm like, that's weird. They don't get stuck in the deep end. And so I got to get it, pull the hose and get it unstuck and went around and threw out some trash. I come back and it's stuck back in the same spot. I'm getting a little annoyed, but I want my pool clean, right? So I get in there and I had to wash my hands off because they're all dirty. I don't want to get the dirt in the pool. Got to get the hose and I'm pulling it off, you know, getting it unstuck. And it's our doing its little thing. I turn around and I come back just to kind of catch it. Like I'm watching you with my good eye. You know, I got to tell your kids about I'm, make good decisions. You know, you have to tell them, make good decisions. Make good, I'm telling them, make good decisions. Turn around, it's stuck right back in the same spot it was in originally. I'm like, this will make no kind of sense. So I go back and I pull it up. I put it halfway into the shallow end. And, uh, and, uh, and I go back. I come back around and it's stuck in the deep end again. Now, I'm slow, but I'm not stupid. At some point, I said, God is talking to me right now. This, this, is, this is too frustrating for this not to be God, right? <laughs> and God spoke to me so clear. He said, he said, you tell people, they think if they get stuck in the same thing too many times, I'm going to leave them alone, but I'm coming back time and time and time and time again. He said to me, son, you want a clean pool, but I want a clean bride, and I'm coming back time and time again. I will get them unstuck time and time again. What good man on a Sabbath would leave his donkey stuck or his animal stuck in a, in a ditch. Of course, even to violate the Sabbath will I get that thing out. And I felt God saying, there's people in this house and you've been stuck and you've been scared to go back to God. You're like, it's, at, at this point, I deserve to be stuck. But let me tell you what, if I could just stretch the analogy a little bit further, I'm not going to let my pool turn green so that my little creepy crawly can get a lesson. God's not going to let your life spin out of control to teach you a lesson. He's coming back for you again. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. He's coming back again. But, but you have to be humble enough to say, what do I need to do to quit getting stuck in the same spot? I have no hope that my creepy crawly will ask me that question. But I trust that God will speak to you in this season. Amen? And number three, you have to be hungry enough. Number one, you have to be honest enough to say, I need spiritual revival. Number two, you have to be humble enough to say, what must I do? Number three, you have to be hungry enough to say, I will do whatever it takes for spiritual revival. 
I will do whatever it takes. Say it with me. I will do whatever it takes for spiritual revival. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll give up that thing on the altar that I hold most precious. You see, Pentecost brings change. And if we think we're going to encounter the spirit of revival and things are going to stay the same, we are deceived. It requires change or it will leave. And I'm here to say I want it to stay. I want the spirit of Christ to stay. I don't want to grieve Holy Spirit. I want everything. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to him. I'm like, hey, I heard about that church that there was a move and they shut it down. We'll take it. I understand that there was a man who fell and uh, he walked in this great gifting and because he fell, the gifting ended and we'll honor him and we'll take the gift. We'll take it here, Lord. We will walk in it. We will be the people that other people despise. We'll be the outcasts. We'll be the odd ones. We just want you, Jesus. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. We just want you. We just want you in our midst, Lord. We will do whatever it takes for spirit revival. Amen? Stand with me. I want to close with this. Ha. 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 Mm. I feel so strongly, and I said this a little bit earlier, that many of you encountered God in a place of training, not knowing it was a place of preparation. Not knowing it was a place of preparation. You thought it was just going to grow. And God's like, no, no, no. That was training for the next season. I say that <clears throat> not as a disqualifier, but as a qualifier. What you lay down, God will resurrect greater. Yeah. Jesus Christ laid down his life. And out of his side, the entire church was birthed. The church is now the body of Christ on the earth filled with the Spirit as Jesus was, doing wonders everywhere. He laid down His life and in the resurrection things are so much greater. Amen? And I just feel like, whoa, I feel like there's some people that, wow, God is, whoa. Mm, you feel that, Mike? It's thick. Ah, I want you to lean into that right now. I just feel like God wants to anoint some people today. Ha. Huh. Ha. Huh. Mikey's playing a song right now that was written in this house and the lyrics go, if you, if you fill me, I'll give it away. I'll pour out my life like an oil. Shekaba. You know the song? Go on, sing right here. I just feel that we're going to do I'm a Vessel if you got it. I just feel this by the Spirit of God that we're supposed to do this. Shekaba. I am a vessel, I lay down my life to find it, lay down at your feet, Spirit of God breathe on us, I am a vessel, my life is not my own. Now I want to lay hands on people in a minute. Whoa! Shaka. My life is not my own. Huh. So I lay down my life to find it, lay down at your feet. Ha. Spirit of God, breathe on it. I am a vessel. My life is not my own. Fill me. Fill me. Fill me. If you fill me, I'll give it away. Pour out my life like an oil. Pour out my life like an oil. Holy Ghost of God. Mm. Shake Kaba. I'm going to begin praying, and the Spirit of God is going to begin falling in this room. And I just want to lay hands on some people, and I feel like He's anointing some people right now. And when, if you feel that beginning to happen, why don't you come forward so I can lay hands on you and bless what God is doing in your life right now? I feel the presence so, mm, so strong in here right now. Shakaraba. Shakaraba. Pour out my life. Shakaraba. Like mm, fire, Jesus. Fire. 
Come on, tell them I'll do whatever it takes, whatever it costs. Shut up, I can't. Come on, come on, come on, press it. Jesus. Fire God. Fire God. Fire God. Fire. Fire God. Take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. That's all for you. That's the anointing of God upon your life right there. And I see God taking you from the last season into the new. And those things that plagued you in the last season will come off your life. They'll break off as a testimony. And many will be set free in the next three. Right there. Take it, 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 take it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank God. Fire. 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 Jesus. say yes and amen. We just bless it. We agree with whatever you want to do in our life. Whatever you want to do in this church. Whatever you want to do in this city. Whatever you want to do in this city. And everybody said amen, amen, and amen. Can you guys give it up for the message today? Can you give it up for what Holy Spirit's doing in our church? We're going to continue to have ministry here at the front. Today at 5 o'clock we have a beach picnic over at South Inlet Park. And uh, we'd love to see you there. But we're going to continue to minister and worship. If you have to go, feel free to leave. If you want to stay and worship and receive, hang out for a little bit. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for coming. And I hope to see you over at South in the Park later. Take care. Have a great day.